the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson. Today, I am once again joined by my bestest friend in the whole wide world, <laughs> Dr. Emma cahill Madrone. Emma, welcome back. Hi, how are you? I am so happy again to have you back on the show. And today we're going to talk about, for sure, one of your favorite topics, Catherine uh-huh. of Aragon, and one of my Ooh. favorite topics, Tudor women. So I can't uh-huh. wait to get started on this. Great. So before we start, I, I first of all, I want to thank everyone who's been listening to the to the to the episodes that we've been doing. Your comments have been amazing, uh, really encouraging. I want to point out one little thing. I am Dr. Cahill Marron. So in Spain, lessons about names again. Oh, my goodness. They're going to hate me because all this talk about names in the previous episode. And now we're going back to names. But in Spain, we have two last names. So my first last name is Cahill. My dad is Irish. My second last name is Marron. So in Spain, people would have uh, two, their name and two last names usually. So that's why I am Emma Cahill Marron. So in 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 America, some people hyphenate this. I've just left it that way. So that I just wanted to clarify that. And I'm Emma Luisa because my mom is Maria Luisa. So there you go. That's that's the Spanishness there, right? That we just name our children after one another until eternity. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Thank you for clarifying, because I think uh, as Americans or maybe those of us who aren't as familiar with Spanish culture, that that was a little bit confusing for us to know what exactly to call you. That's why everybody needs to get out of Spain this year, and then you'll be fine, because then you'll learn all about these things and have amazing food and go and play, visit all these amazing places. So This sounds great. Are you paying for this trip? I don't know, but I do need to contact someone in the government because I need to, I need to be sponsored because, I mean, I, I am <laughs> always... <laughs> you'd think I work for them, right? right. It, the tourism. I don't. I don't, come on, call me, guys. <laughs> I'm sure I'm sure they're watching this right now. Yes, yes. <laughs> well, Emma, we all know about your fascination with Catherine of Aragon. And uh-huh. I think from previous episodes, we've got a little taste of maybe some of the women around her that you know some things about. And I would like to talk about these women today and their relationship with Catherine. And um, why don't we just start with maybe the women who came with her from Spain and who who you think we should know about? That's that's great. Let's start there because that's that's a good place to start because there's many things to say about this. First uh, of all is that the women that came with Catherine, except for a couple of them, were unmarried. So the idea was they would marry men of the Tudor court to become, um, uh, to have interlinked marriages to strengthen that alliance that that Catherine was going to strengthen with Arthur uh, as Princess of Wales. So that's the first thing that we need to to think about is that these women were not, uh, that came with most of the women that came with her were coming to stay. And many of them did. Um, In the case of all of them, I I would think that one of the most uh, notorious one is Maria de Salinas. Um, There's been much debate whether she arrived with Catherine or not. In 1501, she did. Um, In my master's dissertation, I already... Because we have so many documents for Isabella of Castile, because she was a ruling queen, and she was managing all of the arrangements, not only for her dowry, but the creation of, <clears throat> excuse me, of Catherine's household as Princess of Wales, a household that was going to serve her in England. We know uh, we have lists of people, and we have lists not only of people, but what the roles that they were, they were, they had. So Maria de Salinas was from a family that was very linked to the royal family because Martin de Salinas had been one of the secretaries. Her father had been one of the secretaries of Isabella. But the other important thing to know is that he had served her sister for many years. He had served her sister Isabella, the eldest. And this is very interesting because, for example, when I found the gift of manuscripts that Isabella gave to Catherine before leaving, there was one of the manuscripts had the coat of arms of her eldest sister, uh, Por- Arms of Portugal. So I think, that, and we know also that when her 
um, when her brother died, Juan, one of his trumpeters, Juan de Salonia, probably John Blanc, uh, went to the service of Catherine too. So a lot of these people are are serving the royal family for a long time. And then the ones that are of similar age to Catherine end up going to England. And and Maria de Salinas is one of them. The reason why she becomes so uh, important is because she's very highly favored once Catherine is queen. And she becomes even one of the favorites of Henry VIII. Um, There was even one of his ships was named after her. So imagine, yes, one of his new ships that they were constructing. I think one of the problems we have is we don't know, uh, people don't know a lot about the first five years of the reign of Catherine and Henry because they tend to uh, concentrate books and things on when Woolsey rises to power. So when they are talking about that time, they're talking about a lot about what's happening in Europe. But what's happening home is big because they're building uh, a lot of things. And, and Mary and uh, Maria... She's really favored. Um, she marries, uh, um, uh, I can't remember his first name, but he's uh, Willoughby. Um, what was his title? Um, oh, I should know a this. Baron, a baron. He was a baron, wasn't he? Yes. Maybe. <laughs> yes, because she becomes a baroness. Yes. Uh, okay. Willoughby of Eresby. Yes. And then what is very interesting about her is she stays close to Catherine forever. But then she has a daughter who becomes very relevant because when her when her husband dies, she fights for her daughter's right to inherit her uh, father's estate. Um, and she's fighting her brother-in-law. Maria de Salinas is doing this in oh. court. Why is she doing this? Because in Spain, in Castile, women could inherit. She was just used to it. So she couldn't accept that her daughter would lose everything. And who is her daughter? Catherine Willoughby, who becomes close friends with Catherine Pa. Oh, I said it again, Catherine Pa. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I mean, the fight that Maria de Salinas does for her daughter, despite the fact that they end up really strange because Maria remains a Catholic and, and Catherine is a, is reformed, um, she does this for her daughter. So Maria de Salinas is crucial also because she stands with Catherine until the end and... Uh, she's her until the very end because despite the fact that Henry doesn't allow her to see Catherine she she goes into Kimbleton Castle and Catherine dies with her yeah so she is her best friend through and through is that can can I ask you real quick is the story true about her tricking her way into the castle right so there's discrepancies here and I think it's because the source is not very clear um so um is an interpretation of the source, really. Okay. Uh, because it says she disappeared, or I uh, can't remember the exact word. It, it's important. I, I'll look it up, and I'll look at the, the exact word, but it's a discrepancy in, in the interpretation. Okay. Um, so we'll, we'll probably we'll never know. Because as, as, sometimes we don't realize that when we're reading books, we're reading interpretations of historians, of, of documents that are ambiguous. I mean, I read Catherine of Aragon's letters and they're so ambiguous. Sometimes I don't even know what she's talking about. Mm. Right? So it's a lot of it is interpretation. She was certainly, she certainly went up to the door and knocked on the door at Kimbleton and wanted to get in. So, I mean, uh, if she didn't go in, at least she was there when she was trying. The 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 account, by the rest of the account, it does seem like she was there. Yeah, that so was always... Been, yeah. Always my impression, because I, I think the research that I had done, this was many years ago, was that she had asked Henry VIII for permission uh-huh. and he denied it. Uh-huh. The thing is that the account is that she, she she's a very good actress. So Maria de Salinas deserves a, an Oscar because <laughs> she goes up and she kind of um, claims that she's fallen from her horse and she's hurt. So and I mean I mean she's a member you can't just deny she's a she's a baroness you can't just say go back to where you came from so I I believe she did go and and um and then uh, to me what's more striking and I think it's something that is not as known is that legal fight that she has with her brother-in-law it's crazy because this is not typical for women in in England to do this to fight for your daughter's rights in court. She also um, takes, I think at one point she takes, 
Um, no, that's the other one. That's Margaret Pohl. But the women that we're going to talk about, they're feisty. And Maria de Salinas was certainly a feisty one. And a lot of these women that come with Catherine come from the north of Spain, from families from the north of Spain. And the reason of that is because they have economic interests in England. With the, Let's remember that the alliance is not just a dynastic alliance, it's an economic alliance. So a lot of these ships that are bringing wool, steel, this is to, to favor the economic relations between uh, Castile, now Spain, and England. So all of these families have interests in the north of Spain, in those ports. And Maria de Salinas, her family also has lots of interests in Flanders. And there's other women in Catherine's household, like her own camarera, like her own, uh, or her own dueña, no, not her camarera, her dueña, her, the main, the governors, uh, she, Elvira Manuel, she has interests in Flanders too. So it's all connected to this wool trade, uh, trade of commodities and of basically of uh, the passage from England into Flanders because Flanders is key for Spain too. So it's that's the kind of alliance. So these families are connected to merchants, to trade. So they're becoming rich with this alliance mm. too. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> Yeah. So you said Maria was very important to Catherine during the great matter um, with Henry mm -hmm. wanting to divorce her. Uh, is there any evidence of how she showed up for her friend or do we just know that she was supportive? We know that uh, early in her reign, uh, one of the ambassadors, uh, the Aragonese ambassador sending a report back to Ferdinand of Aragon says that Maria is the most influential person on the queen. So that's how influential Maria de Salinas is on Catherine of Aragon. Uh, I think we need to remember that above all, Catherine of Aragon remained a Spaniard until her last breath. So to have a friend who was also a Spaniard who could understand deeply what she was trying to do in England, which was strengthening that alliance, that's probably why she was so close. And like I said before, if her dad had been a secretary to her sister, she would have known these people since she was a little girl, since she was born. So she had uh, ties to them, deep ties. How did uh, Maria and how did a lot of the women, not only Maria, show up for Catherine was resisting? Resisting, for example, uh, not accepting, uh, not accepting to, to not call her queen, uh, not accepting to to to, for example, um, accept the act of supremacy and give excuses all the time. No, I already have a queen. I already did an oath of... And we have to think these are serious things because they had taken an oath to the queen. You took an oath to the king, but the women, the women in the court, the women that were serving the queen had taken an oath to the queen. So it's a very complex matter. I don't know of specifics. I do know that, the, for example, the Duchess of Norfolk sent once a chicken to, to to Catherine when she was imprisoned and inside the chicken there was an orange and inside the orange there was a secret message from one of the ambassadors oh wait <laughs> yes okay cool? she sent her a chicken which had an I orange a present inside. a present yeah have the chicken for dinner right <laughs> but inside the chicken there was an orange and inside the orange there was one of the messages from the from one of the I think it's a, one of the Italian ambassadors a secret message that so they what they're doing is resisting in silence, but resisting um, by not. Ex For example, another person that does this a lot is Henry's own sister, Mary Rose Tudor. She does this. She refuses to accept uh, Anne Boleyn. She is very res she resists a lot to her brother. And you have to think uh, for women to do this to the king is a big deal. Yeah. So maybe we'll have to look into what specifics Maria did. I'm sure she did. I just haven't found the evidence yet, but I'm sure it is. There is. If anybody knows, they can let us know. Yes, please do. You know how to find us. Yes. <laughs> so maybe Mar we have long chats on Twitter with lots of memes. <laughs> yes, and gifts. <laughs> um, so Maria served Catherine quite a long time. She obviously wasn't there with her at Kimbolton Castle. So at what point did Maria step away from being an everyday type servant to Catherine? Oh, uh, well, when her house was dissolved. You have to think okay. that Catherine, so the king announces to, Cat to Catherine, they're not, he doesn't think they're not married anymore in 1526, but there's a long process of um, 
really before they have a, a the, the fight, the legal fight, the Blackfriars trial, and then the the I think the most important moment is the moment that he marries Anne Boleyn, and she needs a, a household, and then especially when she has Elizabeth, and she needs a household too. These are this is the time where. Catherine and Mary houses are dissolved and a new houses, very diminished houses with spies basically are put in place. This is where Maria definitely um, steps away. She goes to Barbican in London where she has a house and she stays, especially after Catherine dies. She lives another three years and she mostly is out of court and just retires. That happens to a lot of Catherine of Aragon supporters. That happens to Sir Henry Guilford too who has a huge row with Anne Boleyn and then goes to Leeds Castle where basically to die off because he's, 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 he doesn't, and he had been a leading figure in the, in the court of Henry VIII. So when all of this new marriage thing with Anne Boleyn happens, there's a lot of turnover of these people that had come with, with the Spanish Alliance because Henry Guilford one of, was one of them. And the start of the arrival of a lot of people that are linked to more of a French, um, uh, side of of the court, so that's really where Maria is. They fall together basically. Just Maria stays in the background. She lives another three years, and then and then she dies. One of the most interesting things about Maria de Salinas is that guess who was a descendant of Maria de Salinas? Can you guess? Oh, I can't. Well, uh, Diana, Princess of Wales, descended from Maria de Salinas. Oh wow! Yep. That's wonderful. So the next king of England, really? Yeah. There you go. That's an interesting. So he's uh, technically just a bit Spanish, isn't he? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe just a, maybe just a little bit. <laughs> just a teeny bit. No, but we have to think every time, and not just with the Spanish alliance, with any alliance. These women brought other women, and 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 we think of the kings and queens as the king of England, but he's his, you know, his predecessors came from everywhere, really. Yeah. The king of Spain, same thing. So, yeah, it's, I mean, it's curious, but I mean, Diana was uh, part of the nobility. So it's, it's not a big surprise because these families are always interlinked, right? Always. Yes. Yeah. Well, you mentioned another name while we were mm. just talking about her and you mentioned Margaret Pohl, which I think. Oh, I love her. I think everybody loves Margaret Pohl. But uh, I want to well, know. Not Henry VIII. Henry VIII <laughs> didn't love her. <laughs> Mm -mm. clearly henry the mm -mm. did not oh, love her he, oh he called her stupid he called her he was you know the way sometimes in public he would talk about women it's just or he would tell women to shut up or things like that oh it's just okay let's not talk about henry the <laughs> uh margaret paul one of my questions is when i first started names again when i started uh sending her she's known by her so paul was her her husband right yeah but she was a plantagenet Yes. Oh, I see that smile on your face. <laughs> well, who doesn't love the Plantagenets? They came right before the Tudors. I they're fascinating. They're fascinating. This and very interesting to Spain again, uh, since Eleanor of Aquitaine and Eleanor Plantagenet. So uh, again, someone who is uh old royalty basically in England gets really attached to Catherine of Aragon, who is also very old. Um, royalty in many ways. So when you study the figure of, of Margaret uh, Plantagenet and Margaret Paul, she's so fascinating. And again, she's a very empowered woman, very empowered woman, and has a very tragic life, really. Uh, because, well, I know, I know you know about her too, but um, she was the daughter of the Duke of uh, Clarence, um, and then uh, and um, Isabel. Do you say Isabel Neville? Because I, I, I saw... think so. And see, now I'm questioning myself. I think it can go either way with her. Because when I was researching for this, I saw Isabel Isabel Neville, and I was like, "Ooh, now we're all." I'm going to do you. What did you do to me with this name thing? <laughs> so I, I we'll have to look that up because you never know. Um, and she was uh, the first cousin. Uh, she was so her her she was first cousins with Elizabeth of York, was she? Yes, yes. Who was the mother of Henry VIII? So right. I mean, she's so so linked to the Tudors, really. And she, when I was researching a bit more about her, 
she was the only peer that had a peer in her own right in the House of Lords in the 16th century, the only woman, along with another woman that was granted this. Who was granted this? Do you know this? Oh my gosh. It's a quiz today. It's I know. Quiz. I don't think my brain is ready for that this morning. <laughs> Who was the, uh, the uh, uh, Margaret Beaufort? No, it was Anne Boleyn. Oh yes, I knew that. <laughs> when she was made Marchioness of, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So those are the only two women in the 16th. So this is telling you how powerful and how influential she was. She has legal battles even with Henry VIII because her family had fallen out of favor and all those things when she, and this is key. So there's a set of people that are very linked to Catherine because they come with her from Spain, like Maria de Salinas, but then there's a, a, another set of people that are very close to her because they serve her in Ludlow, which is Princess of Wales. And Margaret is one of them. So Margaret uh, serves Catherine during her time in Ludlow. And we see other of these servants that become important later on. So her time as Princess of Wales and L in Ludlow was definitely very important for Catherine. And not only for Catherine um, during her life, but also when she has to educate Mary because let's not forget, Mary is sent to Ludlow too, when in 1525, right before everything blows up, right? So um, Margaret is her governess when she goes to Ludlow, when Mary Tudor goes to Ludlow, sent by Catherine and Henry. So this is like going back to that idea that the, the time that Catherine of Aragon was Princess of Wales was very important for her networks and alliances later on as Queen of England. And Margaret is the perfect example. Um, the other thing that is very important to know is that she was extremely favored again when Catherine becomes queen. And in 1512, uh, by an act of parliament, she, the, she's restituted into the earldom of uh, Salisbury. So really, this is the same time that Marina, Maria de Salinas and other women, uh, Inés de, de Vanegas marries one of Catherine's servants, so uh, two or three years into, and this was something that Isabella of Castile was known to do, to marry her ladies off very well. So well, even though it was Henry granting all these things, we have to think that these are Catherine's women, right? So it's the influence and the yeah. uh, agency that Catherine has that these women are so favored. And the important thing about Margaret too, because she, uh, she comes governors of Mary Tudor, she's very important. But she was um, she was a patron of humanism. For example, in uh, she uh, had uh, I can't remember the guy's uh, first name, but some guy translated one of Erasmus's books for her, um, "The Great M Mercy of God." So she was having people translating Erasmus of Rotterdam into English. So when we think about only the reformed women doing these things and that, no, the 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 Catholics were doing this too because humanism became so important. Because M Margaret was someone educated, she realized that people needed things like translations of Erasmus, who was about the most modern guy you could read, really, in at the time. Um, and also, I think a lot of her story is so linked to what, her son does it afterwards and all the issues with her son and her and her final re years really that we forget that she was governess for Mary and that she protected Mary she even when when Mary's household was dissolved uh she asked Henry to continue to be her governess paying it for herself and Mary, and Henry didn't allow it oh so I didn't know this that. is how loyal she was to Catherine and Mary mm -hmm. wow do, yep. Is there any record to tell us how she behaved during the great matter? Uh, well, she was in Ludlow with uh, with uh, Mary, and she continued through all that time uh, to, to be the governors of Mary until that household was dissolved. So, I mean, pretty big role, right? Protecting yeah. uh, someone who went from princess to bastard. So imagine for her, too, for her... You know, she had a status and uh, that as governors of a bastard, that doesn't look very good on your resume, I think. So um, in that sense, being being a second mom, the second Catherine sent her off to Ludlow, Mary was with Margaret. She was not with Catherine. 
Which must have been so difficult for both Catherine and Mary, but at least Catherine knew that Mary was with somebody that she trusted. I think it was more difficult for Mary because she was a child. Uh, I think for Catherine, she had only gone through this when she had to separate from her mother when she I left Spain. And, and she was a grown woman. <laughs> and she had a different character to she had gone through a lot of stuff <laughs> by then. She had been... You know, Henry VII didn't treat Catherine very well at times, too. That's why, in many ways, in respect, she had to become an ambassadress because she was like, these guys are just going to just ditch me and I can't have this. So Catherine was just very ready, I think, because she knew all along that any kid she would have would have that role to fulfill. Yeah. Amazing. Mary, on the other hand, was a very young child, so... I always feel for the children because imagine this as a as a child, right? Imagine getting mm. that 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 message where you're you've been treated as princess your whole life, and your dad only talks about praises you and this and that. And the next day it's like, no, now you're you know you're a bastard, mm, right? And your mom is no longer a queen, and you can't see her. Yeah, yeah, and and I mean we have accounts of Mary even being physically abused oh i don't think i know about that yeah to take it from one place to another yeah yeah and then mary goes through a lot of um uh, illness and i think it's just it's trauma it's not illness really sometimes i think it's just people get sick when you mistreat them tremendously so i think she would just be like okay now i'm gonna shut down because what else do i have to do i mean at one point Catherine writes to her saying, we're going to be martyrs. So you have to take on this with a, with a light heart, you know, and it's, if it's what God wants for us, I mean, that's hard to hear from your mom too. And that's another thing that I don't think we realize from Isabella of Castile sometimes in Catherine of Aragon, duty was first. That's hard for us to imagine. Yes. So, yeah. you know, a mother nowadays would never say to your child face, you know, face the your death with a light heart. You know, it's 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 tremendous to think about. And the other very good advice that she gave her, which I think was it's just the best, is like obey your father in everything except for that that is not in your conscience, right? I so love that. I mean basically it's giving her a free pass. And after Catherine dies, also Mary, when she is um and, and let's remember she's not with Margaret anymore, uh, because when Elizabeth, uh, Princess Elizabeth is born. Mary is sent to serve Elizabeth and she, she doesn't have a household of her own anymore. So by the time Catherine dies, she's in, she, and, and Anne Boleyn is executed. She's basically in limbo until she comes back to court. Um, and during that time, it's, I mean, the, 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 the imperial ambassador, I know a lot of people don't like him very much, but, you know, he's saying, he, sometimes he is saying the truth they were very concerned she was going to be um, executed or poisoned because a lot of people, oh, poisoned. A lot of people <laughs> thought, a lot, uh, and a lot of the, the imperial ambassador and Spanish and, and Catherine's Spanish doctor believed that she could have been poisoned, Catherine of Aragon. Oh, right, that. right. Because afterwards, uh, the story goes what they looked at her heart and her heart was yeah. black or something right, like that. Right, right, right. Yeah. Uh, wow. I really think poisoned was such a key thing. <laughs> And maybe that's just me. The way that, yeah, and the way to describe her death too, right? She 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 stops eating. She not I mean the, maybe we'll do a, an episode on that on the death of Catherine of Aragon and look at could she have been poisoned? I think she could have. I mean, there was certainly people who were saying that she was not going to live very long. So huh. you know, um, so she could have been poisoned, of course. And Mary was scared that she was going to be poisoned. So even there was a, a escape plan. And she tells the ambassador, this escape plan you give him is not going to work because I have to ride so many miles a day and I can only ride this. She knew what she could do on a horse and how she could get to a place. Or not. So, I mean, tremendous, Mary. Uh, and tremendous, Margaret, because her end, right? Because finally, what happens to her? Tell us, Rebecca, you know what happens to Margaret Polk? <laughs> yeah, sadly, she is brutally executed i think is probably mm -hmm. the best way to describe it and i think at the time she was the oldest woman 
or oldest person. I don't know which one it was. How old was she? Oh, I want to say she was in her seventies. I want to yeah, say she was. She was certainly old. So yes, yes. yes. And then yeah, the why, why you say brutally is because the description is that they need more than one chop, right? Yes, yeah. and she tried running away. Whether that's true or not, I don't know that we know right, that for right, certain. Right, right. And this is again those accounts. Do we take what people are saying as evidence of what really happened? Everything is tainted by people's um, ideas, yeah. the, the side of the story, the the way they want to see things too. But let's think about this. Margaret brutally executed. Uh, the other uh, Mary's uh, Latin instructor, uh, Miss, Mr. Featherstone, who Catherine says in her letter when she's going to Ludlow, this guy is going to teach you Latin from now on. I've been doing it, but now he, it's going to be him. He was beheaded. No, he was hanged, quartered, uh, drowned, hanged, and quartered. Um, so... Imagine all these people that had been so important to Catherine Varion and Mary just being murdered left and right. Oh, well, even Thomas More and Bishop Fisher, oh, all of yes. those people. Thomas More had to had to be a, a bad one for Catherine and Mary because of he re- what he represented to them um, and how he had he admired Catherine so much too, you know. And they were so close in the way they thought about humanism and the way they thought about women's education, because Thomas More educated his his daughters. And then uh, there's other connections between Thomas More's daughters and women of the Spanish monarchy, too, that we could talk about some other time. So. Oh, my gosh. we You always open all these doors. There's going to be 12 more episodes just based on our little talk so far today. <laughs> no, what is poison? We know that. <laughs> right. <laughs> So Margaret Pohl or Margaret Plantagenet met her end with an axe, unfortunately, mm-hmm. but there were definitely other women. And of course you brought up a name from the last episode where you dropped a bomb on everybody, Catherine Parr. <laughs> um, her mother also served Catherine of Aragon, hence where she got her name from for her daughter. Yes. And um, she has one of the best names of all time. I think Maud is one of the best names ever. Uh, Maud Parr, yes, yeah, she was very close to Catherine. Not that I know a lot about her background, um, uh, so maybe someone could help me with this, but she was certainly, when I studied her time with Catherine, she was certainly close because she would get, when they were moving from, from residence to residence, Maud Parr always got her apartments next to Catherine. And the proximity to the queen is crucial, crucial, because that means you're serving her closely, right? Um, also the fact that, that when she died, she made her will, she left, like I told you, these things to her daughter and those, uh, well, and the fact that Catherine Pa is named Catherine Pa was because of Catherine, who was her godmother. So, I mean, it's very similar. And then Catherine Pa is friends with Catherine Willoughby, who was also named Catherine because of Catherine Varagon. Yes. There you go. So they're all Catalinas, really. They're all Catalinas. No more mistakes in the spellings. We should just name them all Catalina, right? All right, starting today. The word is starting gonna... today. Catalina Willoughby. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it's true. These are women, and you have to think these are women of the same age and that have been educated. So, uh, so they are reformed, and people tend to see them as the opposite of the Catholic women before they're they're not. They're not really that different. They just have a different view on how that humanism should be developed. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the thing is, before the Reformation started, the Catholic faith was reforming too. So uh, Erasmus of Rotterdam, Thomas More, Juan Luis Vives, these guys were putting into question many things from the Catholic faith and taking the learning from antiquity and, and and translating into the vernacular too. It's, right? pro- so, it's progress, really. What you're seeing is generational progress. And then when you educate, the, it happens in the generation of Catherine of Aragon in the in this Castilian court. When you educate people, people start to have a mind of their own. And when there's a powerful queen that leads by example, she empowers the next generation. But it happens like there's studies that prove. That, you know, I was born in 84. Now you know it. I'll turn 40 very soon. So, um, yeah. 
Uh, but when I was growing up, one of the things that I realized, I didn't have references for many things. So no woman astronaut. I have never knew a woman president or things like that. Whereas nowadays, girls have, have references that we didn't have. Still no woman president reference. So that's that has to change very soon. I hope so. I can't run for president, but you can. I will <laughs> oh, vote not this again. <laughs> yes. Come Rebecca, on, Rebecca for president. <laughs> Rebecca Larson for president. I mean, you would do it much better than any of the candidates. Come on. Here we go again. Moving I'm forward. I'm obsessed. Well, the election is, you know, it's not that far away. But yeah, yeah, I, I, you have to think that Catherine Willoughby, so Mar Maria de Salinas daughter, Catherine Pa, Maud Pa's daughter, friends, um, reformed, highly educated women are not that far. And and did take many things from Catherine Aragon and Mary Tudor. So it, we don't have to see it like black and white. One right. is one is reformed, so she hates the, the no no. It doesn't work that way. They and the, to translate from the vernacular, you have to know Latin. So you know, and we talked about the fact that in the Tudor court at the beginning, the women didn't speak Latin. So there has been a change, and that's why these women are thinking beyond even. The Catholic faith, you know, this is why Anne Boleyn has so many ideas about everything, too, because women have a voice. What happens when Catherine of Aragon dies? What does Henry VIII tell Anne Boleyn? Keep it quiet. <laughs> know your place, woman. So there's also the women could do this be, and, and Catherine changed this, but you were still a woman. So you had to behave a certain way. That's what Catherine really did really well. Not every woman was able to do that because it was difficult. I wouldn't be able to do that, especially not in front of Henry. I would have to tell him a thing or two. <laughs> I wouldn't you... have done well. I wouldn't have done well. In you would have ended up just like Margaret Pohl. <laughs> I probably, probably. No, yeah. Fighting till the end, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. I would run away. Yeah. And she did. <laughs> she ran away. We never saw it. You know, one of the things that I find interesting about Catherine Willoughby and Catherine Parr's relationship is that when Thomas Seymour was executed, he wanted Catherine Willoughby to raise their daughter together, who was named after Mary. So their oh. daughter, Mary, was named after Lady Mary at the time. And, Imagine, yeah. and I just find it interesting that he didn't send his daughter, their daughter, to live with Catherine Parr's sister, Anne, and her husband, instead chose Catherine's good friend, who was of the same religion. And I don't know necessarily what religion Anne Parr and her husband were, but I I, I seem to think that they were more on the side of Henry all of the, all mm -hmm. along, more mm -hmm. the, the Catholic side. But I think that's an interesting little twist that that may, little Mary Seymour was sent to live with Catherine Willoughby. Yeah, no, I I didn't know that. Thank you, and and I I love the way you can you can tell me about all these people, and I'm like, oh, really? I didn't know that. Um, because because I always tend to to think a lot about the international uh, side of things. It's difficult. You can't know everything. Uh, but one of the things that you were saying struck me because you said you don't know what religion they were. Nobody knew. Hmm. In the especially in the 1530s, who knew the king woke up one day yeah. and this was right, the king woke up the other day and this was wrong. And I think that um, devotion and faith is something you can't really detach yourself from that quickly. So, a lot of them would probably be in transition, don't you think? I think it's possible. And you know, uh, Mary Seymour was born in 1548, Henry VIII mm. had died a year earlier. Uh -huh. And so here's Edward the Sixth on the throne with his uncle Edward Seymour as Lord Protector. Who I love was... the way you say with his uncle. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we won't even go there. But you know, the Reform religion was really at the heart of Tudor court at that time. But I'm sure there was still a lot of pushback. Um, Do you think it's all faith, or is it also interests, economic interests? Because every time foreigners are in the picture that think about philip when he marries mary right yeah how much of this is a, a a change of faith how much of this is oh with the dissolution of the monasteries i got really rich or i was favored or so now i'm of this religion because it's so convenient right um 
I, I ask myself these questions a lot. How is it all devotion? Is it all, oh, yes, the Catholic faith is wrong? Or is it everything changed, especially with, I think, the dissolution of the monasteries and, and their lands? And they're, we're giving to people. So changes it changes a lot, right? It's not just religion. Yeah. It's also the money. It is. It most, I mean, a lot of men became very wealthy from these mm -hmm. properties that they obtained. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we sidetracked it from the Tudor women of Catherine Ryan. Uh, since you like when I drop some bombs, uh, let's talk. Let's talk about one another one. So we talked about Margaret Paul. Uh, we talked about uh, Maria de Salinas. But a woman that I want to talk about, very important woman, is um, Susanna Harnboot. Oh yes. Yes, that, that artist. Um, the reason why I want to talk about her is because when I was studying the household of Mary going to Ludlow, there is a mention to Mrs. Parr. Uh, not Mrs. Parr, Mrs. Parker. And we know that Susanna Harnboot was Mrs. Parker because she married uh, a Parker who was um, involved in the wardrobe, which makes sense if she's a painter and an illuminator that she would marry someone from the wardrobe think about it right if she's yeah. painting portraits and he's keeping the all the pretty uh gowns and things so she goes to ludlow with mary and this household is formed by uh catherine of aragon really because she is so henry the eighth we know this because basically henry the eighth tells charles v because this is the time where mary's still betrothed to charles v he tells um him um, don't worry, she's going to be raised as a Spanish infanta because she's going to eventually marry um, the, the king of Spain, the Holy Roman Emperor. Um, so that's why he entrusts her education to Catherine. And she's the one to decide who's, and let's think about it, Margaret Paul started serving Catherine way before she was married to Henry VIII in Ludlow during her time with Arthur when Henry was a little boy. So these connections are much longer. And what I was telling you before, this thing about the Spanish women that were coming with her, but also the women in the Tudor court, um, trans uh, having people translate things like from Erasmus, the connection with Flanders. Susanna Horenberg comes from the court of Margaret of Austria. Mm. So this is basically um, Catherine telling Margaret, I have a need in my new in the household I'm going to form for um for mary and that's why the and it's not only susanna but she arrives uh in in those in the i found a set of accounts that i believe is the dissolution of that household because those artists are incorporated to henry's service after the blackfriars trial and that's where lucas is also mentioned and gerard hornbu who gerard hornbu was one of isabella of castile's favorite illuminators so mar um Susanna Hornbud is the first woman artist we have on record in England. And she was praised by someone like Jura. Or she was included by Giorgio Vasari in the lives of the famous artists. So she was a famous woman. And she serves. And then Lavina Turnley comes to. I, mean, I, I don't want to step into Mel's, uh, Melanie Taylor's uh, expertise here, but uh, she knows all about Lavina. So if, if you need any anything on Lavina, she, she's the one to go to. But we're work working a lot on this because Levina and Susanna are interlinked. They are connected by family ties, yes. And Levina Turnick is also the daughter of Simone Benning, who is one of the illuminators that Isabel of Castile liked the most too. All right. So there's even women that are coming, women that are highly trained in something like Renaissance art that are famous worldwide or European-wide in this case. And they're praised by Jura is one of the most outstanding artists of the 16th century. And he buys a, a picture that was done by Susanna of, of the face of Christ. And he says, it's wonderful that a woman could do this. I mean, Jura, you could have phrased it a little bit different. It would have been nice. But I get what you're saying. I get what you're saying. <laughs> right. <laughs> did, you what you're to, saying. did you have to say a woman? <laughs> did you have to say that, Jura? But it's fine. It's Again, it went the intention it's the intention and i and i think in previous episodes you talked about and i'm going to bring this up again because maybe this is the first episode somebody is watching of the show 
you had mentioned about female artists teaching Catherine of Aragon and her daughter to paint. Which of these women were the ones who did So that? in the case of Catherine, she already knew probably when she came. So this is something we need to work on. Who taught her in Spain? Because in 1513, she when she's regent, she sends a letter to Woolsey saying, oh, well, the Scots invaded and I'm terribly busy making standard spanners. And, and these standards and banners had paintings on them. The Trinity, the, the coat of arms of England, the and some of them are described. They're all painted. It has been proposed before that they were embroidered because Catherine was such a good embroiderer. But when I went back, all of those are painted. Hmm. And at the same time, we have the first reference. I said Susanna Horenboot is the first woman documented, but there is a reference in 1512 to a certain Alice, Alexe of Milan, who is probably a woman too. So it could have been this Alexe de Milan. And it makes total sense to me that an artist from Milan would come to serve Catherine and another artist from, from Naples, who was a man called Vincent Volk, who develops a long career in the Tudor court as an artist too. And they come at a crucial time. And this is why I'm telling you, going back to the beginning, when we were talking about the first five years of the reign of Henry and Catherine, crucial, because when they enter the Treaty of Cambrai, which is the treaty to um, basically an international alliance against France, uh, this is signed in Baynard's castle. So this is Catherine's residence. This is not, this is her doing uh, the deed, right? And uh, she, she, they sign it there. And then what is agreed is that Henry and Catherine are going to, to contribute with an army. So what do they have to do? They have to build ships. And this is the beginning of that great big navy that Henry uh, finally has. If you see all the payments of these years, he's spending so much money on, on boats, one of them named Maria de Salinas. Was it Maria? No, it was named. It was named after Maria de Salinas. But what is the exact name he gave it? I, I wrote it here somewhere. The Maria Willoughby in 1522. Wow. Yeah, yeah. that's just so the, mind blowing to me. That there was the named P, there was the Peter pomegranate. Yes. for example. Yeah. There was the yeah. So yes, uh, the Catherine. Um, the Catherine. Oh, what was the one with for Catherine? He had one for Catherine. Oh, that one. Oh, I, I guess there's one fact about Catherine of Aragon. I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, what I was saying about this, there's also a lot of because they're going to contribute. Not only these boats are going to take horses. They're going to take. They're going to. Um, so Henry goes to France with a lot of people, and these new artists are painting the horse bards, the horse bards, the banners, and this. These new artists that are are first mentioned in 1512 painting banners, foreigners from Milan and Naples. And then the following year, the queen mentions that she's also painting banners and standards. So they were working with her. She was working probably with the first woman artist. Oh, Rebecca, you always make me do these things. So the first woman artist was probably Alice Carmenian. She is first documented in 1512, and she's an artist from Milan, from near Milan. She's probably... Um, She's probably related to Petrus Carmelianus, who had been the Latin secretary for Henry VII, someone who had migrated from Brescia many years before Henry VIII's reign, and who was kind of getting very old. Uh, he was replaced at the beginning of the reign of Henry VIII, um, and he has the same last name as her, so they were probably related. And he's the one, and listen to this, this is very cool. He's the one that writes a poem when Catherine um, wins against the Scots that Erasmus makes fun of and he makes fun of it because he says there's too many womanly um references what? and in another letter of Catherine of Aragon we know that she tells for example she's she's praising women in during this war with uh with the Scottish she tells for example Henry in one of her letters that uh there was an English woman that that captured three Scotsmen on her own I always think it was Brienne of Tarth, but <laughs> you remember yeah, Brienne uh, of Tarth from Game of Thrones? The I, character? I don't know if I do. I probably should. Have you seen Game of Thrones? Oh yes. Yes. The the lady the lady that was a knight. Oh yes. Now I know who you're talking about. I okay. was picture this <laughs> this English lady fighting the Scots and capturing three 
Scott's as like Brianna of Tarth. <laughs> so um, it's probably Alice illuminating these. This there's, there's a. There's uh we have one of these poems but written by Peter Marinus, just one um and it's illuminated with pomegranates. So I think Vincent Volb and Alice Kermillion arrived to England to start painting banished hands of the things with symbols and coats of arms from the Spanish monarchy that the painters in England didn't know how to do. And they don't appear again until that house is dissolved in Ludlow because they were with Mary Tudor along with Susanna Horenboot in Ludlow. So Alice was probably also teaching Mary how to paint. Wow. And, and let's think about this. She's from the same area that another very famous woman artist is later on, Sofonis Van Guisola, who works for Philip II of Spain after Mary Tudor dies and he returns to Spain. He recruits an Italian female painter to teach her his own wife how to paint so could this be an influence of mary tudor into philip that's why he then recruits sofonis van guisola to, to paint in spain probably because we know lavina turnick was working for mary tudor at the time for example and we know that mary tudor had contact with susanna horenboot in many occasions so yeah I love all these connections between the women and uh, and these strong bonds, it seems like they had as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's all connected again to the court of Margaret of Austria and then the court of Mary of Hungary. So Flanders, this is where the art is really flourishing. And this is the kind of art that Catherine likes. This is why she recruits people from there. Uh, because... Uh, Obviously, Henry's paying for all of this. And he these people appear in, in his royal accounts. This is why they've been associated with him. But let's think about this. For example, Alice Kermillion um, uh, appears in 1512 and then doesn't appear until there's the dissolution of this house. So the reason why probably she doesn't appear is because she would have been in Catherine of Aragon's privy purse expenses that were that, that are lost. Oh, yeah that is too bad i hate when that happens when you just lose the trail of somebody because something was lost well something was lost it was it was purposely lost <laughs> or burned <laughs> it was purposely lost so yes that's one of the main reason the main problems this is why for example we can associate the harem boots with catherine pa because she was paying them because they are in her accounts or with Mary Tudor, because we have some of her accounts, not too many, but the ones when she was Lady Mary, but we don't have them for Catherine. And that's why it's very difficult to associate these women with her because yeah. Henry did a very good job of destroying all the evidence that she had been amazing. He couldn't though, because we're still talking about her, right? That's right. We talk about her more than we do about him on this show. Well, you, we can talk about him. If you want. <laughs> no, we're not going to talk about him. No. This is he's looking. He's looking at me right now. So for people who are just listening, Rebecca has a, a, what is it? Isn't like IE generated? Yeah, it's picture? an AI generated AI. picture of Henry the Eighth. I'll move my mic stand mm, here on so her you can wall, see and she also she has a microphone in a way that you can only see his eyes. So it's. <laughs> Um, unsettling to say the least. I do that intentionally. I just want to make you uneasy. <laughs> okay. I'm going to get a new poster for you. Okay. <laughs> it's going to be Catherine of Aragon, isn't it? Oh, you, how did you know that? Are you reading my mind? What? It's, it's almost like I know you. Strange. It's almost like you know me. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've covered quite a few women here. Are there any last ones that you want to bring up today before we close Ooh. this up? Oh, I'll give a nice detail to end. Um, for example, one of the women that we didn't mention that it's extremely important for Catherine is Elizabeth of York. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, not only she had family ties to her and her father had done, Edward IV had had, had contact with um, Isabella and Ferdinand, but also... Um, Elizabeth of York sends messages once in a while to Isabella of Castile. So the queens are in contact. She's the one to recommend Catherine learns French. 
But also when she arrives, she takes her under her wing and she really treats her really nicely. The, the problem is Catherine arrives in 1501. And as you know, um, Elizabeth dies in 1503 after she has a baby, right? Mm-hmm. What was that baby's name? Catherine. Of course, <laughs> Catherine. Uh, one of the things that is very important to know about Elizabeth of York, I mean, she has she's a shadowy figure in many ways and respects, which was amazing. She was amazing. She was very interested in the arts. I mean, Greenwich Palace was remodeled because of a design she designed. So, and this is not even on that um, um, on the um, there when when they're explaining this this uh, the history of the of the palace, they don't mention it often. Mm-hmm. How cool is that? Another very cool thing is in um, in Windsor Castle, in the cloisters in St. George Chapel, uh, there are there is a room called the Catherine Room because um, they found wall paintings that had uh, that when were cleaned and that they could see them, they had references to St. Catherine, St. Catherine of Alexandria, pomegranates. Also, uh, references to the the Prince of Wales. So they realized these were the the these had been painted in, in different stages, and these were probably the lodgings that were created for Catherine of Aragon, because referencing her, and they're done in the Flemish style. And another very cool thing that we know is that we do have um, Elizabeth of York's uh, privy purse expenses for part the end of her life. And she hired one of the king's painters to, and I quote, is to to paint beasts in Windsor. And these uh, wall paintings are covered with animals too. So this is a payment probably for those, and this is as late as 1502. So I think after Alpha dies, she's just doing something nice for Catherine. She's the one who sends a letter to to bring him back because Catherine gets really sick when Alpha dies. You know that, right? She's yes. sick for a long time, and it's uh, and it's Elizabeth who sends for the princess, who is always um, next to her. So it must have been, you know, they always say, oh, Henry could never get over the fact that his mother died. Catherine probably was the same. She had been so nice to her and and she had known her all her life, really. She knew she was going to be her mom in England, right? How hard is that, right? You separate from your real mom, you go somewhere, you have the nicest person as your new mom and she dies. After naming a baby after you that dies too. Yeah, so Yikes. sad. So Yikes. sad. So sad. But that's that's the 16th century for you, in a it, nutshell. It really is. It's it's hard to listen to, but it's it's a reality. So Elizabeth of York has always been one of my favorites too. I love her. She should have been queen. She should have. She really mm-hmm. should have. But mm-hmm. instead, it was her role to strengthen the Tudor dynasty. Exactly. 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 Well, Emma, thank you so much for coming on the show again today and sharing all of your infinite wisdom with us on Catherine of Aragon and her life and the women at Tudor Court around her. I can't wait to have you back again to talk about another fun topic. I don't know what it's going to be yet, but I'm sure we'll figure it maybe, out. Maybe people can suggest topics too, you know? Oh, that's a yeah. good idea. I mean, uh, you know. I could talk for for days about many things, but but you know, I sometimes I think I ramble. So maybe people can tell us what they're interested in, and and we can think about it. But thank you very much for having me. I'm loving doing these episodes, and it's always a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Emma. The Tudor's Dynasty Podcast. <laughs>